and I am thankful to be here tonight at the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And I do realize Tom was telling me, he says it's primarily a black church. And I said, well, that's great. I'll fit right in because I was raised on Motown, play R&B and punk drums and gospel drums. I said, man. You play I'm, music, don't you? Yeah, so I know that I will, I will fit right in. Now, my, my mom did. She raised me up in the Motown music, most of my favorite music. Stuff I was listening to up here is usually gospel choirs and things like that. So, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm kidding around. I am glad to be here tonight, and I'm wonderful, wonderfully uh, blessed to be able to present God's truth. That's Amen. what we're here to do tonight. God's truth as opposed to um, what the world is calling truth today. So, I'm going to start something here. I didn't know what kind of crowd we'd be speaking in front of, but I just titled this first slide, Discovering Truth. And before we get into Discovering Truth, can we have a word of prayer briefly? Jesus, we thank you, thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to thank discover you. your truth and talk about the things of God. Now we want to ask Lord Jesus that we would use our minds tonight and the Lord that you would bless our hearts tonight and let us have our hearts open to what your truth, what your word says about interpreting the world around us. Now we ask and pray Lord Jesus you. that you would just give us just, uh, just a, a refreshing in your spirit tonight and let us have an excitement walking out of here yeah, yeah. To, to just embrace all that God's word has for us. That's what it's all about, Lord. We're thankful that your word is, is immovable. Lord, it cannot change. It will not change. We're thankful that it is settled in heaven. And so, Lord Jesus, help us to embrace your word and think about these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now... What this is based off of is what's called in theological circles, maybe you all have heard of this, the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. And what the Wesleyan Quadrilateral, what that big word means, was it, it was West, John Wesley's system of truth, or what he would, what would be called a hermeneutic, a system of truth in order to discover what truth is, or a system of finding things out. First and foremost, John Wesley would say, that he would always go to Scripture first. Scripture is the first test of all truth. And then if you can't find it in Scripture, he would say the next test that could be more most reliable would be tradition. What do we see in the history of the church? What do we see in the history of humanity? What does the world have to tell us about these things if it is not found in Scripture? Then thirdly, he would say human reason. What is reasonable? You know, Paul... Uh, was it Paul who, or uh, might be not Paul, but I believe it was Jeremiah, who said, let us um, reason together. We need to, uh, you know, be reasonable. I believe that Christianity is a very reasonable faith. It's a very reasonable faith against all other faiths and philosophies in this world. And then lastly, and dead last, is experience. Experience would be um, last in discovering truth. Now, unfortunately, What's happened a lot today is people have taken experience and put that above Scripture. And But it's not to say that experience is not important. We can experience God, but it is does not come before uh, Scripture or what we have seen throughout church history. And I could, go, I could go into a lot of detail about a lot of things just based off these four things. But what, what really impressed me and what the Holy Spirit laid on my heart just yesterday, I've actually been working on this presentation off and on over the course of the last six six weeks, but just yesterday, how powerfully that we can look at the questions that we're going to ask, we can look at these things in light of all four of these things, and all four of these things will line up with this truth. So it's, what I'm trying to say is we will find what we're about to talk about in Scripture and tradition and reason and experience. And when you have not just one thing, but all four of these things lining up, with what, we, uh, with what we're going to be talking about tonight and proving these things, then we can trust that these things are true. The question I would like to ask tonight, if everybody can read this on our PowerPoint slide, it says, can Darwinian evolutionary ideas coexist with the Bible? Can Darwinian evolutionary ideas coexist with the Bible? By Darwinian evolution, what I'm talking about is molecules to man evolution. Now, what you all... We didn't plan this, but basically, 
What Tom has brought here in this little jar with the black lid on the table is actually, is actually what, you look at it real close, there's something swimming around in there. Those are freshwater jellyfish. Um, rare little thing, you know, I've never heard of them until this year, but they're swimming around in there. And something similar to that is what Darwinian evolution would say where we have began. Exactly. Is that would be an, an ancestor of, of ourselves. We, well, I'm not saying we evolved from jellyfish, but we evolved from some sort of, you know, small cell organ, organism. I'm not a scientist, and this is not a science uh, presentation. This is a truth presentation, so we're not going to get heavily involved in the science, just what we well, can see. Well. So, throughout this presentation, we will also answer these questions like millions or thousands. Millions of years or thousands of years. Does this really matter? Does this really matter in today's in today's language, especially within the church? Or how about can the biblical historical timeline be trusted? The as Tom has laid out upon our table over here, what you what you see there is actually a timeline of the history of man according to the Bible and several several other historical sources. The history in this timeline begins with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it shows all of our ancestry throughout the ages and generations. Can that historical timeline be trusted? And what damage can be done by an evolutionary worldview? And I'll go ahead and throw out this three sentence or three word sentence here. Ideas have consequences. Ideas have consequences. We'll be looking at that just <clears throat> shortly. Now, how many of you know, according to Genesis, the Genesis account, how many of you know in how many days did God create all of creation? In how many days did it take God to create? Six, Six and then he rested one, right? <clears throat> On day one, do you know what he created? Right? Earth, space, time, light, heavens and the earth. Day two, what did God create? Some would say the atmosphere, day three. Dry lands and plants, day four, right? Sun, moon, and stars, day five. Sea and flying creatures, and day six, land animals and man. So let me ask you this question. <clears throat> On what day were the dinosaurs created? You ever thought of that? Here we have a little diagram showing the outline of these things and if dinosaurs which we know exist you know were created um, with land that they were land animals we know they exist um, they would have had to have been created on day six if we're going to take the Bible absolutely literal Did you ever thought of that also we can see and how long did God create how long did God create we could also see that um, he created each day within the context of one day. It's amazing to me how people will use this um, argument and try to say that, and, I, and we're going to have a little question and answer after this. This may be a little different than what you've heard before. I would hope not, but um, it's amazing how people will take a context out, a scripture out of context in the New Testament and try to apply that to an Old Testament scripture and say, well, in the New Testament, does it say, like, a day to the Lord could be a thousand years. But in this context, you see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, you'll see here, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the first day. See in Genesis 1, 8, and God called the firmament heaven so that evening and morning were the second day. You see this pattern going on and on and on. So the evening and morning were the third day. Evening and morning were the fourth day. Of course, in Genesis 1.23, evening and morning were the fifth day, and so on. And what you're seeing there with that word day is the Hebrew word yom, which is a day as the warm hours, whether literally or from sunrise to sunset, or from one sunset to the next. So what we're seeing here in the Genesis account is that God created the earth in six literal days. 
And just in case you had a hard time, you know, God, I think, has a sense of humor, especially how he set this up. In case you're questioning that, he said also, so evening and morning were each day. So he gave us the exact word. He gave us the evening and morning, and he plainly put it in the context of Scripture that things were created in six literal days. Welcome, guys. <clears throat> in that sixth day, picking up in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its time, kind, cattle and creeping thing, the beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, the cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. So, then God said in verse 26, You see the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the original man, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's pretty amazing. Amen. Now, <clears throat> what you're seeing here is just taking Scripture just as exactly how it should be read. Now, one of the things that I appreciate about John Wesley is the same thing that I appreciate about Charles Finney and Jonathan Edwards and a lot of our church or, or, or post-Reformation church fathers, they were, they were thinkers. They were smart people. They were people that, that really studied this kind of stuff out. I don't know how much you know about John Wesley himself, but John Wesley, he taught Latin. He taught Greek at Oxford University. He taught Hebrew. He made a Latin grammar, Hebrew grammar, a Greek grammar in the back of his works. I'm sure Greg's seen that in the back of his works. The very last work talks about all these different languages. He could speak fluently five different languages and two of them were dead. <laughs> he, he taught at Oxford from the time he was 23 years old up until the time he really started going out and doing the, the Methodist revival, which is why we're sitting in this room tonight. Methodist you know, church. <laughs> yeah, the Methodist church. He, you know, and he was a student of history and they, they would say that on Monday, and I'm not, I probably got the, the subjects wrong and I'm not trying to venerate John Wesley. I'm just saying... I'm saying this to say something else. I want to set something up here. John Wesley would spend Monday studying one subject, Tuesday studying another subject, Wednesday studying another subject. He was a lifelong student. He spent hours upon hours studying. When he wasn't studying, he was holding a revival that swept the, the country of England and sent missionaries all over the world. He was a man of the book. He was a man of several books. He actually said at one time, he said, I am a man of many books, but I filter all books through that one book. Because he said that his book, the system in which he tested all truth, was God's Word, the Bible. Now today, what are they saying about Christians? Christians are stupid. They're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, in a lot of ways, we're just, we're just reciprocating. We're just speaking out what some of these people like John Wesley has come before us and had no, they had no problem accepting that the earth was thousands of years old, for instance. Because the Bible taught that. <clears throat> so on this subject of dinosaurs, this is kind of fun. So we're going to spend a little bit of time with this. So just get your, get your brain moving a little bit this evening. Sir Richard Owen <clears throat> coined the term dinosauria in 1841 when they discovered this dinosaur fossil that he's standing beside. Now, that's the reason we don't see that in... <clears throat> the Bible. You don't see that word dinosaur arise, show up in the Bible. Now, of course, because the last documents of the Bible, as the slide says, were written, you know, almost 2,000 years, you know, prior. The King James Version, though, uses the word dragon 34 times. Now, I think today, like many things, we, when we hear something told as a fairy tale our whole life, we have a hard time believing that this could actually be true. You know, this could actually kind of have some truth to it. But if you look at just what God's Word says here, Deuteronomy, Deuter I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 32, 33. I'm not going to read through all of these. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Can anybody tell me what an asp is? It's a snake. Is a snake around? Is, it, is an asp still around today? It is, isn't it? Psalm 44, 19. Thou hast sore brokenness in the place of dragons. 
and covered us with the shadow of death. What's that psalmist saying? That there is a place where these things would dwell, right? Let's look at, let's see here. All the wild beasts, Isaiah 13, 22. All the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged. Jeremiah wrote, and Hazor shall be a dwelling for dragons. Now what we know about dinosaurs is simply, there's no way that humans could live in the same place where these things are living. So when God sends judgment to a place, what do we know from God's judgments? That he just absolutely makes the land totally desolate. So that would make sense that these gigantic, tyrannical lizards would move in or there would be no human beings. More on that later. Micah chapter 1 verse 8 is interesting here. It says, Therefore I will well and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a welling like the dragons and mourning as the owls. A welling like the dragons and a mourning like the owls. Like, You've got to give science, uh, modern day science, credit where it's due. But they can look at how these things were structured in their neck and things. They can, they can kind of interpret how they may have sounded like. And I've never heard any anybody say that a dragon would have squeaked like a mouse. They say they wow, they wail, they roar. It is something very, very loud. So <clears throat> the dragons that we see in history could also be interpreted as dinosaur because the word dinosaur comes after the word dragon. And the way that people interpret things is through the words that they would have that day. The way that they would interpret, interpret what they see around them is they would give it a name not unlike our dinosaur name. A gigantic wild beast, lizard, that we have, I mean, it's, it's this thing's monstrous. But that leaves us with that question of what does the fossil record say? So how long does it take for a fossil to be formed? I have a fossil up here, by the way. What is this, Tom? Calamedes stem. Calamedes stem. It's a little fossil. If you guys would like to turn pass that around, it's a fossil of a plant found about a mile from my house in Jackson down there. How long does it take for a fossil to form? Anybody have a guess? I like a million yeah. years. A million years? Two thousand. Two thousand years. Look, here's a little. You guys watch that show MythBuster. Here's a little MythBuster for you. Fossilization re relies totally upon environment and chemicals, and not time frame. Let me prove that to you. How many millions of years did it take to fossilize this hat? <laughs> Anybody know? Two million? We'll have to look up the carbon dating for that. I'm not really sure. How about this human bone inside this cowboy boot? How many millions of years do you think that may have taken to fossilize that? How about this teddy bear? I would think the environment would have something to do with it. Yeah, yeah exactly. These things were found around volcanic eruptions. When certain chemicals come up from the deeps of the earth, kind of like in Noah's flood, when the fountains of the deeps opened up, when certain chemicals come up from the depths of the earth, it creates an environment in which fossilization can occur very rapidly. We see all of these fossils were less than 100 years old. So how long does it take fossils to occur? Less than 100 years old. We could, an honest answer would be I'm not sure. That would depend on the, chem, the chemicals that were in the environment. Not what modern science would say today because they have a specific date for these things in which they can say, well this dinosaur was 65 million years old because it was part of this period we find it in this fossil record. But how do they really know that? How can you really know? Let me ask you this, when do you dig up, like do you dig up, when you're digging up fossils, are you digging up the past or are you digging up the present? The past, I would say. You're digging up the present That's what because I would say. you're observing, you're observing what you're digging up as you dig. You're observing what you dig, so you can't, re you weren't there when those things were covered up, was set them. Further, there's such things as living fossils living fossils, which this is how they explain plants like this one that they thought had went extinct, but this is one of the oldest in the world, 
it's a it's a certain pine tree that grows in Australia. Thought it went extinct. It found one living. This is it in the fossil record right here. For this gigantic monster of a fish, the coelacanth, I think so. Hey, that big, big word. They uh, they found that off the coast of India. India. They thought those things had gone extinct, extinct millions of years ago, and now they're finding schools of them. <clears throat> but this right here is one of the most fascinating things that I've seen. They discovered this in Montana. This is living tissue from a T-Rex. <laughs> living tissue from a Tyrannosaurus Rex. They found found this around, I believe it was 2006. I don't have it up in my notes here, but it was. They found this in 2006, and after six years of study. They said, well, it must have been the iron that kept this living flesh from decomposing for 65 million years. Now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but when I drive by, drive by a freshly killed animal on the road, I know that that freshly killed animal is going to be totally decomposed within a couple of weeks. There ain't no way. Sorry, pardon my Eastern Kentucky right. right now. There ain't no way <laughs> that that can last 65 million years in any environment. But modern science refuses, refuses to believe that anything can be outside of the construct in which they have already, which is what? Darwinian evolution, which says that we must have evolved over millions and millions billions of years. <clears throat> the Bible mentions many living creatures that are still in existence today. As we already went over, here's the asp. I'm sorry if nobody's a snake fan in here. Oh, we can get through that one. I see people. Just... All right, we're gone. Here's a cute little coyote. We can leave that right. <laughs> they make a noise, noise like a dog. They go around about the city. The lion, uh, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon. Thou shalt trample under feet. How many of you are familiar with the description of a dinosaur in Job chapter 40? You ever seen this before? Blows my mind. Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass like an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins. And his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. Now many of you have study Bibles here tonight. And I would say if you looked in your margins in your study Bibles, it would say something like, could be an alligator, could be an elephant, could be a hippopotamus. I have just now, for the first time this year, I can't remember the publisher that put it out, but they put out a foundation study Bible, it's called. That was the first time I've actually seen them say this could possibly be a dinosaur-like animal. First time I've ever seen that. But this, that just came out. Surely the mountains bring him forth food. This right here, this, this is what really pops out here. He can draw up the Jordan into his mouth. Now, <laughs> that's a big animal. Big animal. Now, this right here, his tail is like a cedar. Now, we all know what a cedar is here, right? Big cedar pine tree, right? So if your study Bible is telling you that this could possibly be a hippopotamus, here's the tail of a hippopotamus. <laughs> okay? Not like a cedar tree. How about an elephant? Again, not like a cedar tree. Can we think of any animal in history that may not be around anymore that a tail could be like a cedar tree? <coughs> How about a brontosaurus? How about a brontosaurus? Now, this is where this is where it really gets fun for me. The reason I am passionate about this is I've spoken to Christians on this subject, and I've heard things, and and this is and this is not because this is not because they're foolish, and it's not because they're unlearned or anything. So there's a lot of common beliefs in the church when it comes to dinosaurs. One of those that really breaks my heart is the dinosaur fossils have been put in the earth to, as a trick of the devil to try to lead people away from the Christian faith. And what you see in there is a struggle to how, how do we explain these things? How do we explain these things? And there's almost a fear to mesh science with the Bible because so there's a healthy fear 
because science has come out almost diametrically opposed to the Bible. Science, the science world has came out almost diametrically opposed to the Bible, so it's a healthy fear. But at the same time, we shouldn't fear knowledge. We know that we have fossils, and I know that some of you probably have grandchildren and children. And I know that some of them are one of these days going to have going to ask you a question similar to or have to do with this subject. Granny, Poppy, what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? And what would you say? And a lot of people aren't ready. That's why I have a passion about this because I want you to be able to take this stuff and if your co-worker brings up this or your your kids bring this up, what you're doing is you, you are first and foremost saying, you know what? I'm not completely sure. I'm about as sure as the scientists are. But I do believe that there's a lot of evidence that can support the biblical worldview along with what we see in science. And there's a whole lot of evidence out there that does not support a flat earth. <laughs> that one blows my mind. I'm sorry if that offends anybody. But there's a lot of evidence out there that supports a young earth. <clears throat> For instance, we're going to look at some extra biblical evidences that support biblical truth. For instance, on the side of this Buddhist temple in Cambodia, you can see how these people in the last 2,000 years decided to draw that on the side of their temple. Any of you that have probably seen Jurassic Park or know anything about dinosaurs could probably tell me what that is. Anybody know what that is? Starts with an S. She almost had it. Steg, Stegosaurus, right? <clears throat> these things are these Inca stones found in modern day South America. You can see right here, if you can see the outline, this is a, an Indian on top of what looks like to be a small sauropod like brontosaurus like animal cutting its head off. Over here you see a, just a plethora of different kinds of dinosaurs, a stegosaurus there, some sort of velociraptor looking thing, looks like a brontosaurus here, another thing like a sauropod there, and a, blatantly a triceratops. You can see its head and its little thing right here. <clears throat> More closer inspection will show you these things too. Here's another dinosaur-like creature. Obviously these people dealt with these things on a daily basis in order to have to, to feel like feel the need to draw them. This is in one part of the world. This is my favorite right here. This, this guy riding a triceratops like a horse. He's not fighting it either. They're sitting in an axe. He's smoking a peace pipe. So obviously we can, they're just hanging out on top of it, using this thing like he would a horse, you know. We're going to look a little bit into Marco Polo's diary, how he documented in just a minute, how he documented what he saw. But this was uh, some Chinese art from, you know, then probably north, northern China, um, depending on where he went. Um, the Chinese were just... They were obsessed with drawing these things. And a lot of these things, this is not new to us, but these are several hundred years old. I mean, we've seen these things in our textbooks and things in school, but we, we can blatantly sell, tell it's a triceratops there. You know, these, these things are not unlike what we've already seen. Here, you have over here in the Native American uh, cave paintings right here in America. There's another one out there. It's not as good as this one. This is an outline, by the way. Somebody outlined it so you can see it a little better of an Allosaurus, which in all of these paintings and all of this artwork lines up with the type of fossils that they find in these parts of the world, which is amazing to me. And Marco Polo, as I, I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> he opened up what was called the Silk Road. He explored a lot of China, and he is a, he is a European, went into China and was documenting in his diary just the things that he saw around the uh, 1271 to 1295 A.D. And this was a little bit lengthy, but it's worth reading. Leaving the city of Yaqui and traveling 10 days in a westerly direction, you reach the province of Karazan, which is also the name of the chief city. And here are seen huge serpents, 10 paces in length. Now let's think about that a minute. One, two, three, four, I'm going to run out of room, five, six. I have to stop at six. 10 paces in length. 10 paces in length, about 30 feet, and about 10 spans, about 10 feet, girt of the body. At the forepart, near the head, they have two short legs, having three claws, like those of a tiger, with eyes larger than a four-penny loaf, and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, 
and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are met with of a smaller size, being eight, six, or five paces long, and the following method is used for taking them. Now, this is really interesting. In the daytime, by reason of great heat, they lurk in caverns from whence at night they issue to seek their food and whatever beast they might meet, they meet with and can lay hold of, whether tiger, wolf, or any other they devour. After which they drag themselves <clears throat> towards some lake, spring of water, or river in order to drink. By their motion in this way, along the shore, and their vast weight, they make a deep impression as if a heavy beam had been dragged along the sands. Those whose employment is to hunt them observe the track by which they are most frequently accustomed to go and fix into the ground several pieces of wood armed with sharp iron spikes which they cover with sand in such a manner as to not be perceptible. When therefore the animals make their way towards the places they usually haunt, they are wounded by these instruments and speedily killed. The crows, as soon as they perceive them to be dead, set up to scream and this serves as a signal to the hunter who advance, who advance the spot, hunters who advance the spot and proceed to separate the skin from the flesh, taking care immediately to secure the gall, which is most highly esteemed in medicine. In cases of the bite of a mad dog, a penny weight of it, I'm talking about the, the gall of this dinosaur, dissolved in wine is administered. <clears throat> it is also used in accelerating parturition when the labor pains of women have come on a small quantity of it being applied to carbuncles, postules, and other eruptions on the body, they, they are presently dispersed, and, in this, and it is efficacious in many other complaints. The flesh, also the animal, sold at a dear rate, being thought to have a higher flavor than any other kinds of meat, and by all persons is esteemed, and by all persons it is esteemed a delicacy. Now, why would he go into such graphic detail if he wasn't just taking note of the things that he was seeing taking place before him? And that's Marco Polo. <clears throat> that was Marco Polo in about 1200. Then in about 1400, Bishop Bell in his tomb, Bishop Bell, Richard Bell, he entered the monastic life at Durham, about 16 years of age, remained a monk for 50 years, during which he was ordained a priest, and earned a degree at Oxford, and following period as prior of Durham, he was promoted to the office of Bishop of Carlisle in 1478. When he died, just a couple hundred years after Polo's diary was, was written, he was so fascinated with dinosauria or dragons, he had them seal his tomb with dragons all around it. This is called the history you don't hear in secular universities. And all we're doing is we're talking about observations. This is just um, this observations. Why all the confusion? Simply put, you're dealing with man's word versus God's word. That's all it is. It's man's word versus God's word. I'm going to show you how this works. What kind of dinosaur is this? Okay, I was... I tricked you there. It's not a dinosaur. What kind of animal is this? Pug-nosed bulldog. Pug-nosed bulldog. That's one of the best ones I've ever heard. I can see that. How about a panda? What kind of thing is that, you think? Wolf. Now, why would you say it's a wolf? Teeth. Teeth. What kind of food does this thing eat? Wolf meat. <laughs> about fruit? It's a fruit bat. You see how we've been programmed to think these things, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, what about this thing? Well, this would be a little bit easier. That's a turtle. Turtle? I think it's a parakeet. It's a parakeet? What kind of food does it eat? Nuts. Oh. It's a squirrel. Oh. But you, you see where your mind goes. Yeah. You automatically evaluate what you've been taught in school. It's got jagged teeth, therefore it must eat meat. 
You know, it's got this kind of frame, therefore it must be this kind of animal. Mm -hmm. So when you dig up these bones and these fossils, the best thing you can, the best thing people do is, they can do, is just kind of, you know, put something to it. Now, what would this be? Some of you guys that have know what Lucy is, you already understand where I'm going with this. So this is what science has done for us. The first woman? It's supposed to be, yeah. Yeah, okay, so now this is Lucy, what they found. This is Lucy, what they added to her. The brown bones are what they actually found. Everything else, including the human-like face, was something they, they fabricated and put together. Now, why would they do that? It's called evolutionary ideas. And then, taken out of a children's textbook, you have that. That's how that works. I'm oversimplifying it. I understand that. We don't have all night, but <laughs> that's how this works. The origin of species is where this idea came to be. Maybe you've never realized this. I just taught this to our kids at our church. Use a lot of these same slides. Maybe you haven't realized this, but <clears throat> racism is very popular today. Has anybody else noticed that? I have. It makes me sick. I don't like it. I, I hate it. But we're basically, through science, being taught racism. The Origin of Species, book by Charles Darwin, by means of natural selection. We usually just hear this first title, but this, this title is often ignored, which was his title, The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. What was he presupposing there? He is saying that one race is superior to another race. The Bible teaches that we are all from one blood, that we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. He had many sons and da daughters, Noah and his sons. And then the people at the Tower of Babel caused the dispersion, which is why we see the different identities that we have today. But there is no such thing as race in the Bible. Race is an unbiblical word. As a matter of fact, if we went through the science of this, which I'm not going to do tonight, we would see that there is very little difference between somebody who has darker skin than somebody who has lighter skin. There's no difference in us whatsoever. But Charles Darwin said things like this, the more civilized so-called Caucasian races, white races, have beaten the Turkish hollow in the struggle for existence, looking to the world as no very distant rate when an endless number of the lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. Hmm. Taken from his Bible, the Origin of Species. <clears throat> Another quote from Dar Darwin. He, right here in this first quote, um, freely admitted that the evolution of the eye would be absurd. Like he, he just said, suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection. Seems I freely confess absurd to the highest degree, and in that I would agree. But this second quote really, really bothers me. A married man is a poor slave, worse than a Negro. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and the hands, the average power of a man must be above that of women. And then we wonder where all of our ideas that we see in our culture and observe in our culture come from today. <clears throat> the evolution, what it does, it basically, <laughs> you know, professing, to, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans chapter 1, verse 22. What you're seeing, you're seeing this today. The men of greatest wisdom in our culture, whether it be, you know, your Richard Dawkins or your Sam Harris or, or these, these people, they're part of the new atheist movement and people consider them to be just so wise and millions of people just prescribe to their, or subscribe to their podcasts and just engulf everything they have to say. But they're foolish. The Bible says, though, the man that says that there is no God is a fool. I love how God's Word is so clear about that. Now, part of my passion in this, too, is not just to equip you, is that I used to be an atheist. God rescued me from atheism. I say it with tears in my eyes because I said so many horrible things against Christians, against God. And it, and it literally is that, you, that somebody is clouded with evil in their mind. They're clouded by evil. I was. I can say that, at least in my personal experience, I was clouded by evil. It wasn't the matter that I could not believe 
it was it was a matter that I it was a, it was a matter of I didn't want to believe it. But I'm thankful today that through God's word and through Christian witness, we can get rid of these evolutionized terms like races and come together in a room like this and fellowship with one another and love one another in the presence of God's spirit. What was the turning point for you? Turning point for me. I tell you, ask me that when we're done. Okay. I don't want to get off the it's train a of thought. Long story. Oh. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens. I just watched this the other day. Christopher Hitchens is a very well-known atheist that unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago and never made a profession of faith. And I really hope that he would, because he's he's actually kind of a likable guy when you listen to him talk. And uh, he's funny sometimes. But he was asked when he was asked by a famous apologist today, William Lane Craig, about what he felt was like. He said. Would you believe in God? He said, I would be very depressed if it were true. And why is that? Because he did not want that morality in his life. See, if there is a God, there is a standard. And if there is a standard, there is a judgment. And that's what's fueling a lot of atheism today is this free thought idea that I want to live my life how I want to live it. And I don't want anything or any God to intervene with that. Or any idea. But ideas have consequences. This is, this is depressing. I'm just going to warn you. Some of these things are very depressing. Like the Oda Benga tra tragedy in 1906. Thanks to Darwinian revolution, evolution, this man was abducted, I believe, from Australia and caged with wild apes as part of the human zoo exhibit in the Brock Zoo. He was showcased as a possible missing link of humanity between apes and humans. But we can look very plainly at Oda Benga and say, this is a man created in God's image. Adolf Hitler was captivated, captivated by evolutionary teaching. If you ever get a chance to read his book Mein Kampf, don't read it. Just look at some <laughs> of the <laughs> look at some of the excerpts. That's all you need to see. Was captivated by evolutionary teaching probably since the time he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas, quite undisguised, lie at the basis of all that is worse than Mein Kampf. <clears throat> and his, in his public speeches, Hitler reasoned that a higher race would always conquer a lower, and you would see that. In this expert from his book, he said, the Germans were the higher race, destined for a glorious evolutionary future. For this reason, it was essential that the Jews should be segregated, otherwise mixed marriages would take place. Were this to happen, all nature's efforts to establish an evolutionary higher stage of being may thus be rendered futile. What was Adolf Hitler's idea? Evolutionary biology. And he took it serious. Many other men took it serious too. Who killed the most people in the world? You know, a lot of people say, well, look how many wars have been waged in the name of religion. But I will tell you, in the 20th century, we have seen more genocide in the name mm. of science than we ever have ever seen wars in religion. You look at these last three men here. Each one of these drops of blood represent one million people that they wiped off the face of this earth. Each one of those drops of blood, one million people. These last three men, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong, by themselves, they think that they may have killed nearly two over, between somewhere between 200 and 300 million people in the 20th century. Why? Because they did not value human life. And they totally embraced all three of those men. That men were not created in God's image. They're, the weaker links have to go. <clears throat> we're familiar with things like this in our culture where Jews marched through the streets in Germany and mass genocides where people lay dead in the street. <clears throat> we're in Russia, they were wiping out people they didn't they didn't feel like some human lives were even worth the bullet that come out of the barrel of the gun and they would just beat them to death instead and then these mass graves we found in auschwitz holding thousands of corpses with just naked bodies one stacked on top of the other after the other after the other after the other after the other and you tell me an idea doesn't have consequence <clears throat> These men were fueled by the idea that human beings have no worth. That we are just the next step in an evolutionary process. Therefore, we need to make sure 
this evolutionary process is purified. With man's ideas, your life is meaningless. Meaningless. With God's work, your life is meaningful. It's just that simple. One of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 139, beginning at verse 13, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days are fashioned for me. When as yet there were none. And I am thankful that because I am created in God's image, there's a purpose, there's a calling upon my life. This you're experiencing part of it. This is the reason that I exist, is to worship my God and enjoy Him forever. <clears throat> and in this way I worship Him tonight because I was created in His image to do what He has willed for me to do, which is stand in front of a group of His people and equip them in this way and preach the gospel to all those who will hear, whether in a church or on a street. I am just there for God's use in however way He wants me to be used. But when I really embrace what Darwinian evolution teaches us is that I am just another link in the chain somewhere. It, may, it leaves you thinking like a lot of people think today. <clears throat> When we come from the water, when we come from molecules to man evolution, eat, survive, produce, eat, survive, reproduce, eat, survive, reproduce, eat, survive, reproduce. It leaves man always thinking, as Looney Tunes used to, actually, the Looney Tunes philosophy used to cover this all the time. What is the meaning of life? Aren't you glad that as a Christian you don't have, that's not a mystery for you? Amen. That's not a mystery for you. It's to worship Amen. God yeah. and to live for Him. That's the meaning of life. And it's totally opposed, totally opposed to what the world views the meaning for her life. So discovering truth, back to our West, Wesley, uh, Wesley and the quadrilateral scripture. It's theologically indisputable that the earth is less than 6,000 years old, or any more than six to 10,000 years old, and here's why. I'll ask you this simple question in closing and we'll open up for questions. When did death enter this earth? Death entered this earth as a consequence of what? Sin. Sin in the Garden of Eden. Death cannot predate the Garden of Eden. Man predates death. Therefore, there could not be millions of years of death and suffering on this earth before the Garden of Eden before sin entered the world. Tradition. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, that one. Tell me again. Say that again. Just flash it up here at first. Okay, you ready, Greg? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> it's theologically indisputable. In Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, God said, if you eat from that tree, you will die. That's my paraphrase. Right. <clears throat> and as soon as man ate from that tree, death came into this earth. Therefore, man was created from the dust of the earth before death ever entered the earth. So how could there be millions of years of death and suffering before sin entered the earth? Secondly, tradition is historically tested. We just went through a whole historical overlook of how this could be historically tested. Third reason it is evidentially argued. Reasoning, reasoning is that you can reason with one another and you can argue this point just by the several slides that I've just shown you and the argument that I presented tonight. I would not mind to do this at all with with anybody who had this worldview. Because it's hard to argue with somebody who has a solid foundation of truth. Truth always wins arguments. <laughs> An experience, what we have experienced in the last 20th century is that a worldview that is opposed to the Bible is morally detrimental to society. I would go so far as to even say and turn their argument around on them, as many as the many of the new atheists are saying today, is that religion is morally detrimental to society and we need to therefore get rid of it. But I would say that their evolutionary ideas are morally detrimental to society. And one thing that we have in the ball and airport in that department is the last hundred years of 
200 plus million people being wiped off the face of this earth in genocide in the name of Darwinian ideas. Can Darwinian evolutionary ideas coexist with the Bible? No. They do not. But you know that there are there's a certain denomination, a Wesleyan holiness denomination, I won't mention their name, so I'm not part of them, so I don't feel like I have the right to do that. But there's out of all of their colleges, not one of their colleges teaches creation. They teach theistic evolution, which is a mixing of these two ideas. But we can see those two things do not work together. Those two things do not work together. In other words, can God use evolution? No, I don't believe he did. If he did use evolution, then we have to completely disregard the foundational truths that are set forth in Genesis 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. We have to completely just throw them out. And what happens when you throw out a whole pericope, a whole set of scriptures, a whole several chapters of scriptures? What happens when you do that? Well, then we can redefine other things in the Bible. We can throw other things out. Can gays get married? You know, is abortion okay? You know, all of these things can just start, and all of a sudden you see these things start penetrating our culture. And the only reason it's penetrating our culture is because it penetrated our churches. A good friend of mine up here works in the, works in Moorhead. He's an undercover drug enforcement officer. He, uh, <clears throat> he told me, he said, Bill, the best thing that we can do, our best effort is to slow down the drug problem in this area. Until the churches stand up and do what they're supposed to do, we cannot raise the moral climate in this area. That's our job. That's our job. But when we let the world's ideas come into us, then we lose that power and authority to raise our people up to a higher reality, which is what God's people should always be doing. Fear, O oh Lord, forever, O oh Lord. Your word is settled in heaven. If God's word says it, I believe it, and that Amen. settles it. You ever heard that? That's a wrong statement. If God's word says it, that settles it, whether we believe it or not. <laughs> that is the history book of the entire universe. That's all I have in this wow. picture presentation. Now, if anybody has any questions, Greg said he'd answer. <laughs> Were you going to give Bill uh, no. five minutes to show his snails or something? something like that? <laughs> Does Tom have a presentation? You want this on? Tom, can you?